As we go through this course, you may have noticed that I'll talk about something and give the basic information, and then we'll add more to it later. Especially as we learn new concepts, we go back and revisit it. Sometimes it may be the same information, but just hearing it again brings it to the forefront of your mind. That is, we keep this fresh and we keep talking about it and review it to make sure we hadn't forgot it. And that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna review and make sure we have everything tied together for these condensers. And then I'm gonna add another little point to it that, so first we'll talk about the condensing in it. It's got three basic jobs. The first section is to de-superheat. That's the first little bit right here. And that's gonna be sensible heat. So if we look at our condensing coil, the de-superheating is happening just in the first top little section. Now, this is a very small condensing coil, but even a larger one, it's just that very top section. If we were to measure the temperature here and the temperature here, saying the temperature coming in and say the temperature somewhere at the beginning, there's gonna be a big number drop. Overall though, there's very little BTUs of heat that's being rejected just in this top little section. Now the middle of this, this is key, the middle of this, the middle section of this condensing coil is where we're changing state, we're condensing. The refrigerant is changing state from a vapor to a liquid and it's rejecting tons of latent heat. That's change of state. That's the hidden heat, we can't measure it. The temperature here and the temperature here or all the way through is gonna be about the same temperature because it's a change of state without a change in temperature. Tons of latent heat. Remember that latent heat is so important. So the refrigerant starts, so to speak, raining, and we get here about 50% liquid, 50% vapor, and down here we get all liquid. So that same thing's happened. We get little droplets of liquid forming here about half and half, and then down at the very bottom, we're finally a full column of liquid refrigerant. So it's changing state. Now the temperature is the same, but we've pulled out tons of BTU of heat out of that refrigerant. So we're moving the air across it, we de-superheat it, we condense it, change it from a vapor to a liquid, and then the very last thing that we do is we subcool that liquid. We can measure this now with the thermometer. So the last little bottom row of this condenser approximately is our subcooling, and it's taking it below a saturated temperature. So here it's 100% to liquid, and then we subcool it even more. We take even more sensible heat, and you can measure that, and that's where our formula for subcooling comes in. The liquid saturated temperature, which is taking place approximately here, PSIG converted temperature, minus my actual liquid line temperature, so the line leaving the condenser, the actual liquid line, equals our subcooled liquid, how much subcooling, how much sensible heat we've taken out of this condenser. This particular condenser is what we call a tube and fin. There's a tube here, and then that's where the refrigerant's flowing, and then we have all these aluminum fins. If we think about thermodynamics, this is better heat transfer. The refrigerant's flowing through this tube, so the length of this tubing helps us have more time to exchange heat, as well as all of these aluminum fins, and aluminum being good at transferring heat, and the number of these fins also help us transfer heat more effectively. And then the more air that we pull through it, even again, magnifies how much heat we're transferring. So we're able to transfer heat. Now the refrigerant's gonna be a warmer temperature than the air. Here, here, and also here, it's all gonna be a warmer temperature than the air. So as we're taking heat out of the refrigerant, it goes to the air. So if you fill the air out of the condensing unit, it's gonna be warmer. And that's where your thermodynamic laws apply. It all ties back together. Now in the drawing, we do it like this because it's easy for us to visualize. And some condensers like this are very straightforward. This is an air-cooled condenser, tube and fin. But not all of them are that way. Let's take a look at one that looks very similar, but a slightly different idea. Here we can see that there's two separate rows. And what they've done, we'll just pick one for coming in. Let's say the line in the top comes in. And when it comes in, it's coming in to these two U-bins. So the refrigerant actually goes in two different directions. It's going up and it's coming back down. So the refrigerant's going back and forth, back and forth. If you look at the other side, at the end of the row, it crosses over now to the inside path. So if we see the inside path, we're coming back and forth, back and forth, from the top down and from the bottom up, we're going back and forth, back and forth. They both come together right here at another U-bin, and from there it carries on out the other side. So in this case, it's not exactly doing it where it's de-superheating at the top, saturations in the middle, and subcoolings at the bottom. But still the process of how it works is still going to apply. Let's take a look at yet another air-cooled condenser. This is just a segment that we cut, and here on the edges, you can see 
where the tubes are. So these are the tubes for the tube and here's our fins. And this one's quite dirty, there's a lot of dirt on here. I leave this on purpose so we can start seeing, hey, dirt is gonna be an issue. That's gonna slow down thermodynamics. The dirt is a coating and dirt works as an insulator. So it helps slow down heat transfer. We don't want that. Here we have damages in these fins that also slows down airflow and that airflow slows down heat transfer. So it makes it ineffective. Now, if we're moving less air across this, we're taking less heat out of the refrigerant, now we have to have higher pressure to transfer heat in the same amount of space. So we have to have higher pressure. That's why we want to make sure these condensing coils stay clean. So if we look on this one, this, it's broken off here, but this is where a discharge line would come into this tube right here in the side. And if we notice, the discharge line comes into this tube and the refrigerant goes two different directions. It goes up to the top, and it also comes down here in the middle and splits off into two different tubes. If we're to follow all of these tubes back around, they eventually come back together at a basic header. So here we're coming back together here. This tube then connects here and all the refrigerant piping ends up working back together. What it then does is go back to the bottom again and on the other side, we don't have that piece, but it ends up going the very last few rows are all one straight circuit. That's where our subcooling is taking place. So it's going back and forth, back and forth, and this is where it's sensible heat. So we're leaving as a subcooled liquid refrigerant, and that's where we're going to be measuring our subcooling. So we have one line coming out, we have one line coming in, but the line coming in splits between a few different locations. There's a thousand different ways manufacturers do this and different ways they divide it up. The engineers have spent tons of time deciding what they think is best and their airflow patterns and doing tests and labs to make sure they're having the right amount of refrigerant heat transfer for the design of their equipment. I want you to understand that even though we draw it in two dimensional here, there's multiple ways to take care of that in reality. Now, as we're talking about that, there's yet another thing I want you to think about. Sometimes you'll end up with double rows. You have one set of tube and fins and you'll have another set that they'll put next to each other and the refrigerant's flowing in multiple different patterns. But as you have airflow, the fan is pulling air. Now the fan's here and it's pulling air through this condensing coil. You also end up with dirt built up between these fins, but also dirt will build up between these two sets of coils. Sometimes it can be very difficult to find that. Sometimes you take the whole entire top off of the unit and you have to be very careful, very careful, and maybe you wanna do this with an experienced tech first, but you have to separate these two coils and be able to clean them effectively. Once we get into doing practice with maintenance service calls, we're gonna be doing this live. Don't try to separate any, anybody's coils yet, but when we do a maintenance service call, we're gonna show you some of these examples, but that dirt can build up in between there. That dirt is gonna cause a problem with our second law of thermodynamics. It's gonna slow down our heat transfer. It's gonna do that in two different ways. One, it's gonna slow down airflow. Number two, the dirt acts as an insulation, and that insulation is the material type. It's going to slow heat transfer. So two things that we wanna be careful of. Now, all of these examples were air-cooled condensing coils, and we have yet another type of air-cooled condensing coil. This is a newer type of air-cooled condenser coil, and it works really well. There are some other things to consider. So here's an example of it, and this is what we call micro-channel. And if we look in the very end, There's these little channels that run back and forth all the way across the system. So we have one header bar and all of these little bitty flat channels that run out. And notice how flat and how small these channels are. If we look at our tube and fin, we see there's a significant difference in size of the tubing. Well, the idea is that more refrigerant is touching more of the metal in these flat channels. But wait, it gets even smaller. These little bitty tubes right here are divided up again and they have let's see this one flat channel i'm going to count 30. so there's 30 micro tubes in this little bitty channel so let's call it micro channel little bit 30 individual tubes there's a lot of refrigerant touching a lot of metal so it's great for heat transfer it's much better for heat transfer than this large tube. If you think about this large tube, refrigerant's only transferring heat on the very outside edge of this pipe. So if it's transferring heat only on the outside edge of the pipe, the refrigerant in the middle isn't really doing that much for heat transfer. So this is much more effective at heat transfer. Then as we have the aluminum fins here, we also have these little aluminum pieces back and forth here. This one, tube and fin, is typically 
copper and aluminum, but it still can be aluminum and aluminum, whereas the micro channel is typically entirely aluminum. So this is really great for heat transfer. We can move a whole lot more heat in a much smaller area because of heat transfer. But there's some other things to think about. Because these channels are so incredibly small, they can get stopped up. And that's important for us to think about. We talk about brazing with nitrogen, making sure our lines are clean, making sure there's no contamination in there. All of that is really important with these micro channels. These little channels can get stopped up if you let any little contaminants in there. Any little contaminants can stop this up. A lot of people prefer this because even though it wasn't as good for heat transfer, it let a massive amount of contaminants flow straight by. So there is a difference in design. People say, well, we never had the flow of nitrogen before. Well, before you didn't have these micro channel condensing coils. So it's a little different. I'm not gonna say which one's better because it depends on what you're working on and what the application is. I can tell you this is better for heat transfer. I can tell you this one is better for any type of contaminants. Now, the application is gonna be very important and the environment it's being worked on and serviced with is also gonna be very important. How you clean these is also gonna be different. The material and the chemical used to clean these is much different than how you clean these and how you fix leaks in these are gonna be much different than these. We'll get to those part of the course later on. We'll look into the very end of this. You can see that we have a pipe and then all those little micro channel pieces come into the very end. So these work really, really great as far as heat transfer, but let's also think about another issue. Let's talk about the subcooling. Here we subcool into liquid. As small as these tubes are, they don't hold very much liquid. At some point in time, we're gonna be talking about doing a pump down where we store liquid refrigerant inside of the condensing coil. When we have these micro channel tubes, we're not gonna be able to store refrigerant inside of these condensing coils because these tubes are too small. There's not enough volume to do that. So sometimes we're gonna add some components to make that work. So difference in design, operation, and how you take care of these systems. So these are air-cooled. There's one more air-cooled system we have. General Electric was the first company I saw that used these, this type of condensing coil. And all it is is a tubing. Here we have tubing where refrigerant ran through here. And then all of these little fins. It still had heat transfer. We transferred the heat from the warmer refrigerant to the aluminum, from the aluminum to all the different fins. That's increased surface area. And we're able to transfer heat. We still had to pull air across these fins. We saw the runner warmer refrigerant inside. How they manufactured this is cool. There's some videos on it, but they simply wrap this. It looks like tinsel from a Christmas tree. And they wrap this around the tubing. Most of the time, this tubing was made of aluminum and had a very special connection where they went from aluminum to the copper. So this was a spider comb fin and this type of coil is very popular still with American Standard and Train who originally was General Electric. So this is all air cooled. We're taking the heat from the refrigerant and going to the cooler air. The refrigerant is going to be a warmer temperature than the air. I can only cool this liquid line down to what the air temperature is. I'm not gonna be able to cool it below the air temperature. But the fan is gonna be essential that I'm moving air through the condensing coil. So the pattern of the airflow. If there's something on top of this, it could recirculate the air back around. If there's dirt, maybe there's something blocking it where it can't get air in. Maybe it's too close to the house. Maybe there's shrubs on it. You gotta be thinking, hey, I gotta have enough airflow through my condensing coil so that I can transfer heat. It's very important. When you're standing refrigeration cycle, the airflow side is absolutely critical.